Good evening, everybody. Is all behaving yourself? Mm -hmm. Bless the Lord. It's a good night tonight. It's a good night every night. Mm. Praise the Lord. Still want to continue on from our teachings uh, and working our way through some of the, the scriptures that we've been looking at. But I also just want to start off by uh, saying some things to put this teaching in context or as a point of reference. So sometimes when we speak about the feast, uh, the feast of Israel, uh, for those of you who've been on this journey for a little while, it's, it's quite second to you, but obviously there are times when we need to just go back and just give people a point of reference to know where this fits. And so before I really get started tonight, I hope you can sort of, is it all right to read, look at this board here? We, God's been teaching us along the lines of the feast, the seven feasts of Israel. And it's been like a road map, really, of coming back into his presence. And with these three major feasts, I'll put them up as the three major feasts, but you've got Passover. I hope you can read from the back. If you can't, you can come and lay on the floor if you want to. There's Passover, Pentecost. All right. And then this other feast called Tabernacles. And when we speak about the Feast of Tabernacles, we're not speaking about reenacting the ceremonies back in the day. Every one of these feasts, we're not reenacting anything. We are looking at the principles of life. We're looking at the substance of what they represent. All of these were done by uh, and, and uh, instructed by God to do these feasts and to have these celebrations and, 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 and all of that. But they pointed to a person, and that person's name is Jesus. Yeah. Last night I was talking to the youth. Give me a J, J. <laughs> Give me an E, yay. I'm not going to get me an old for that, but it I, I fires me up. All right. So it all, all these principles and laws of life, they speak to Jesus. They speak to a person who has fulfilled them all, right? And so if Jesus fulfilled them all, and if Jesus, who is the Christ, and Christ is in you, then everything that's been said is already in you. What we've got to grow in, and let me say it like this, I'll split the difference here. It's not us, and it's not Christ maturing himself in us. He's already matured. It's our understanding catching up. It's our understanding that has to mature as to who we have inside of us. Because you can only speak, walk, and talk according to what you understand. When you understand something, you believe it. What you believe, that's, that's what you walk with, right? And so the word is given to us in order that we might understand what and who is in us, right? For a purpose. So if Jesus is all these three tabernacles, when we were born of the Spirit of God and Christ came into us, can I say to you that all of the feasts came into us, right? He just didn't put his right foot in there and tested the water in you, said that would you accept him or not. He came fully into you. Amen. So we have the embodiment, the fullness of who Christ is, who is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He's in you. Christ in you, right? The hope of glory. Mm -hmm. And these laws of life, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and Christ is in you, right, has set me free. Now that word to be set free is not saying supersede. In other words, it's not saying it's helping you get through and, you know, so that sin and the law of sin and death is minimized, although that is where we are at the moment are right here, these two feasts here, we've experienced, and I'll get into this in a minute, <coughs> oh, excuse me, if I can get a drink of water, maybe. 
drink of water or some medicine, Coke. <laughs> My wife's trying to get me off it now. Oh, precious Lord. I think that's why the Lord sent women to keep you on the straight. All right. So, <clears throat> so Passover has three feasts, right? Now, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, all of these seven feasts are recorded in the book of Leviticus 23. You can check it, check it through. But we'll see that it first starts off as Passover itself. We know that Passover is when, back in the day, when uh, in Moses' day, when they, the children of Israel come out and they put the blood on the, on the doorpost and on the lintel, and uh, when the death angel came, those who had the blood on the front of their door, the spirit of death passed over. Amen? And so because it passed over them, they, the death angel didn't touch them. So they celebrated that from that point on. So Passover, we know about that. And uh, also in this feast here is unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. All right, that's, 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 that's the second one. Now, leavened bread, bread speaks of the word. Un means, and, and leaven means is tied in with sin. So, and it's always tied in with sin. No matter where you go from Genesis all the way through, you'll find that leaven will always refer to as sin, right? So, so unleaven means a word that's not coming out of your soul. It's not coming out of the character of your sinful nature. So when you got born again, a lot of a lot of you, or a lot of a lot of you, was now speaking what God would speak, and and you were learning to speak out of your heart from your spirit. Your songs change, your allegiance, if you like, to the world had dropped off a lot, and now you started to learn a new language that was coming out of your spirit, right? Because of that, you were partaking of unleavened bread or words that have nothing to do with the soul. Now, we still struggle with this area here. There's still things that we go on in Pentecost and on in Tabernacles. We still speak sometimes out of our soul when it comes to the things of the Lord. Now, you can speak out of your soul if you're learning, you know, to, uh, and skilling yourself in the computers and, and other areas of education and your career and your work. There's nothing wrong with using your mind, your intellect, and your will. But it's when it comes to interpreting the word, when it comes to speaking on God's behalf, he has to initiate it out of your spirit. It has to be God speaking to you to get a revelation about him, and that's, that needs to be, originate out of your spirit, man. When it's spoken out of your spirit, then it's unleavened. Right? It's unleavened bread. But if it's coming out of your soul, it's stink with leaven, right? It means it's coming from the soul. So a lot of times if you want to discern something, whether it's from God or not, go to the source. It's either the soul or the spirit, only those two areas, out of the soul or out of the spirit, right? And then you can sort of pick up on it. But just to understand this flow on here, Passover, unleavened bread, and then we have first fruits. All right, first fruits. Now, this first fruits, there's a Hebrew phrase that is interpreted from first fruits, and the Hebrew phrase is this in the beginning. That's what first fruits mean in the beginning. So when when you and I got born again and got saved, God put a seed in us that was to grow and mature. This is not the end result. It ends up here. It comes out into a fruit. But the beginning here that he's put in us is to give us the potential of this in the beginning of the second man. This man child has already put, been put in us. It's the first fruit. It's the in the beginning is in us. We have the in the beginning. Amen? Oh, I mean, this word started out with that. In the beginning. The first fruits was there. Can you risk an amen? All right. So when you were born again and I was born again, I had this 
in me, this is a potential that will take to, that will manifest into this man child that we speak about on and off. Now Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, it stands on its own. It's just called Pentecost. Now when you got born again, right, the cloud moved, and when it moved, so many people saw the cloud and knew there was a move of God, and they moved with it. Still born of the Spirit of God, but moved on. They had the understanding of being born of the Spirit of God, but now a progressive revelation moved them on to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, with the evidence, right? And to move in the gifts of the Spirit. So it was a progressive revelation moving as the cloud moved, right? Now, when the cloud moved, a company of people, the moment they moved, because they moved, then those that were here in Passover, those that are born again, the dynamics change in the church. Because these people, when they moved, it created that if you stayed there, you would be left in its own limitations. Now we can put under here, if you get right into the teaching, you can put under Egypt, you can put another word here, Babylon, and then you put the New Jerusalem. Because when a group of people move on, if they don't move with you, they become limited. Now there's a company of people that are speaking in tongues, baptized in the Holy Spirit, have seen the cloud move one more time. The fact that these people moved changes the dynamics back here. Now, if you stay there and don't move on, you can have your bells and whistles, but when I tell you, you, you are celebrating within the city of Babylon. You are in captivity to a system. And it's called the Babylonian system, even though you speak in tongues. Because a company of people in the old days, they moved out of Babylon, went on to rebuild Jerusalem, which is the new Jerusalem that we're coming into in this feast. All right. Now, a lot of people don't know that this movement is going on for years. All I knew is to get people saved, straight away get them baptized in water, and then get them baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was church. Amen? As soon as you get... Good one, brother. Go and do likewise. All right? But you see, there was more to what Jesus did. All right? There was more to what Jesus did, and that is his blood and his resurrection has, in this feast, removed sin and death, eradicated. Now, when I was growing up, I believed that. I didn't know how, when, where, and why it would take place, but I had this in my heart that when I read 1 Corinthians 15, it says that we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I believe that, that when Jesus returned, that that's what would happen. How many believe? What a, now, that's still going to happen, but now it's getting down to the nuts and bolts. It's now coming down to the business end of ministry, if you like. Yeah. We've got to know every, everything that God is going to tell us, because we are the generation here that will understand how, when, where, and why this change and transition and transformation will take place with inside of us. That's for this area here. So, I'm trying to give you a point of reference and the difference. In this area here of Passover and Pentecost, this was known, and still is known, as the church, the church age. I might put that up, church age. Right? Now, when we move across to here, into Tabernacles, Jesus said something very interesting because in this feast here, this is the baptism of what? Water. Water. In Pentecost, this is the baptism of the? Spirit. Of the Spirit, right? Now we know the baptism of what? Fire. Fire is here, but Jesus uses another term to give us understanding. He said, unless you're born of water, Passover, unless you're born of the Spirit, Pentecost, he said, you cannot enter, he didn't say fire, he said what? Kingdom. Oh, so this here is now the kingdom age, kingdom of God age. And Jesus said that. To give us an understanding, yeah, there's scriptural evidence about the fire, but when he said you must be born of water, 
and of the Spirit, and can I say this, there are so many people that are missing this middle area here, they just get born again and they want to jump straight over to here. Well, you can't do that, right? Because you need that to understand what's going on over here. Over here. Amen? You've got a school here. You've got grade one to seven. You can't come in here at grade one and grade three and say, I'd like to go to university now. What? There's a lot of fundamental things that you've got to know and learn that brings it out of your character and growth to understand what's next. Right? The steps of a good man, they're ordered by the Lord. His word is a lamp to my feet and a light to where I'm going, to my path. But I stand here, I can see it, but I've got to walk it out with understanding to get there. It's a progressive revelation, step by step, to come into this area here. And I need the light of his word to take me there. Thank the Lord for Passover and thank the Lord for Pentecost. These two feasts remain open. They're still open. Even though a company of people are over in this area here, there are still people that need to be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I get up on Sunday mornings and I'll speak a, still speak an evangelistic message, put a little bit of flavor there with the Pentecost, and then I'll try and bring in the net bring everybody into the kingdom at the end. <laughs> Amen. And if you're just a kingdom-minded person, I don't need to throw out a net. I just come with a, a yes, big gun. <laughs> because you're already there. Your heart's open to understand. So you need to grow more in understanding. But just as a point of reference, where I'm speaking tonight is on this area. Right? So you'll hear the difference in the change because all of this here this feast of trumpets, say trumpets. What does trumpets signify or mean? What's it the symbol of? The prophetic, right? Trumpet speaks of the prophetic word. So the feast of trumpets, and then the day, I'll just put day at DOA. What does that stand for? Dead on arrival, right. <laughs> day of atonement. Because right. God's, uh, God's after knocking out the man of sin in us. We're, something's got to change in us, people. You know, we put up with our own selves for years. I am tired of me. Yes. Amen. Now, you don't have to agree with that, but, <laughs> but you know, it's true. Are we tired of ourselves? There's a nature within us that doesn't want us to go on to the cross and to have the work of the cross in us. Having said that, this is the law of substitute. This is the law of identification. He died, at, he died for me. Over here, he died as me. That's different. It's a world's, world of revelation in its application. It's so different. All right. So, from here to here, and this is the journey that we're on. At the moment, you're sitting in a meeting, pretty much in a Feast of Trumpets meeting. Because as we get into the word, the only purpose of this trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, <clears throat> is to give us prophetic eyes and prophetic ears to see and hear the substance and the reality of the Day of Atonement. All right, back in, the, back in the day, in the Jewish day, they would have this Day of Atonement, and you could read about that, but the substance of that is what we're looking for. Because it's over here, that this man of sin will be dealt with, the cleansing will happen in our soul, and Christ will come, and we see all the marriage will take place. By the way, I'll just put that as a demarcation there, because when you speak about the coming of Christ, and when you speak about eschatology, and you speak about everything that's to do with his return, everything is over in this area of tabernacles. You cannot speak in tongues and expect to get correct information and interpretation of, of a revelation of the Day of Atonement when God had given and gifted to the church the ability and the prophetic to see and hear the substance of this. Why would he, why would he give you the understanding if you're sitting in Pentecost? You've got to move across. And you've got to have eyes to see, ears to hear the kingdom in order to understand the reality of this feast. So for years, I've sat here, and I've looked across, and we all had a go at interpreting the word, but you know, it, it, 
Gammon, nothing happened. You know, there was no real thing in there. We're just talking dust, vapor, you know, feathers that get, get, get consumed. All right, so God had to instruct us through a lengthy process of pain to bring us over and to say, oh, I understand, Lord, at the Feast of Trumpets, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 13, Jesus spoke about the parable of the sower. And when he spoke about the parable of the sower, he said these words in Matthew 13, 13. Okay. He said, therefore speak I to them in what? Parables. I speak to them in parables because the disciples come to him and they said, you're always speaking in parables. In this same chapter, Jesus, Jesus said, or the, or the scripture reads, that without a parable, he did not speak to them. In other words, he just continually spoke to them in these parables, in symbolisms, dark sayings, mysteries. He wrapped up who he was in these sayings. Mm -hmm. So it says, says here, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they don't hear, neither do they understand. All right? Up in verse 11, I should have started there maybe. Maybe verse 10. The disciples came and said to him, why speak you to these in parables? And he said, because it's given to you to know, to know what? The mystery. It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Right? But to them it's not given. And then he goes on to talk about in verse 13. Therefore I speak to them in parables. So he's talking about the mysteries and the parables is what's, what hides the kingdom. He didn't say church. Not on any occasion does it mention that Jesus preached the gospel of the church. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Because the gospel of the kingdom is where the change will take place. He started it here in, in, in uh, Passover. He's continued it on in Pentecost. And both of these feasts have their place. But both these feasts are also locked into their own, their own parameters. They can't move across. They are only given by God to do what God sent it to do. So over here, the word for Pentecost and all its, its dynamics only strengthen what God has put it there for, right? So Passover and Passover people cannot look across and judge those that are in Pentecost because they've not gone across. Neither can Pentecostal people look across at men and women in tabernacles who's walking through this other order can come across and condemn them. Out of court, holy place, most holy place. So the priests when they were in the outer court had on a certain garment. They could not go into the holy place unless they took off that garment and put on another garment, right? So when you have on a garment, it also speaks of a character. Out of that character, it speaks. So this language is different to this language. And guess what? There's another garment here for the holies of holies on the day of atonement. The priest went once a time in the year and he put on another garment that was different to this one, different to Passover, because the character that we're coming into and the language is different to Passover and Pentecost. Where does this language come from? It comes from understanding through the Feast of Trumpets that gives us eyes to see, ears to hear, the substance and the laws of the Day of Atonement and how the change is going to take place. This is the second coming. This is the transformation, the changing and the twinkling of an eye. It all belongs in the Feast of Tabernacles. If ministries are not baptized into this area here, they've got nothing to say. Absolutely nothing to say. Because it's according to the pattern. They're still in the outer court. I don't believe what's going on there in the most holy place. How would you know? You have, you've never been in there. Yeah, well, I don't believe in tongues. You've never spoken in tongues. Right? But a man, and a man who's gone here, here, and he's gone into here, he can look back and make an assessment. And the Bible says that he can judge 
all areas because he's already gone through to come to here. Amen. He can look back and judge it according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But a man who's mature can look back and judge it all. You know, amen. In other words, you say, no, you can't say that. And you need to say, no, you can't. Ah, oh, but you know, you can do that all for a thousand years. That's not going to bring you into any understanding over here. But Pastor Brian, you know, I'm faithful speaking in tongues. You can do that as much as you want to. But it has nothing to do with this area over here. You have to, in fact, to come across, you've got to actually humble your heart. And somehow, Pastor Ant, you've got to strip yourself of all this, this stuff here because you can't use this experience of Passover. You cannot use the experience of Pentecost because you've not gone in this way before. This way has nothing to do with these ways. This is the way that we come into. It has a language on its own. It has its own experience. So you can't say, oh, I was used to like this and maybe it's like that. No, there's no such thing as Passover and Pentecost in here. This is a different feast. It has a different purpose and the dynamics of it is all about change and transformation and the laws and the principles that govern it. Mm -hmm. That's why we've got to understand from the word looking at scripture that Jesus said to know the mysteries what does he mean by to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven it means to unpack it not to unpack this stuff here although this is all part of the kingdom but Jesus said unless you're born of water and of the spirit you cannot enter the Greek word for enter means to become one with this feast so we baptize people in water, we get them baptized in the spirit. At least they are now aligned and positioned to move forward as their heart opens towards this teaching. Amen? Amen. People of God, that's how it's going to happen. Has, oh, but Pastor Brian, you know, the Lord knows my heart. That's why he's talking to you. He knows your heart. And he knows where you are. He knows where you're positioned in one of these feasts. God knows that. See, I can talk to someone for about five minutes and I know what feast they're sitting in. And even if they're sitting in Pentecost, I know how strong they are in Pentecost. You know, the only time they speak in tongues is if something's going wrong. Ooh, shukabalabala. Shukabalaba is not going to deliver you. All right? There's got to be a flow and a river that continues to flow. All right. So, he says here, because it's given unto you to know the mysteries, to unpack it, the kingdom of heaven and the laws of it, right? He says in verse 13, I speak to them in parables. Oh. So Jesus said, I, I deliberately speak to people in parables. I am hiding who I am. Hmm. I'm hiding who I am by the language that I'm using for this reason. He wants to test our hearts whether we would walk towards him to have a relationship with him, to literally initiate a relationship with him to know who he is, what he is, and to know intimately what's going on, right? You know, I said this before here, I think, in Innisfail, but my, my son, I know you have one son, Edward, but when he was, uh, I think it was about three, and I just got back from work and I was sitting in the chair in Cardwell, and in front of me was the window for outside, and I was looking, but I could see his, his uh, silhouette, I could see it in the, in, the, in the glass. And he was down the hallway, and he's looking like this, and he back, he looked like this, at me, for whatever reason. And so I wanted to get him out of there. I said, Edward, I said his name. Then I went and said, That's how I talk like that. And that head come out like, What did he say? You know, I waited a little while and that head went back. I said, Edward? And this time he came out from out the room. And I kept saying it. And he kept coming down, right? As soon as I knew he was right here beside me, all I wanted was to grab him and hold him. I want to tell you, your father knows your name. 
but he's talking out in parables. He's trying to draw you out because all he wants to do is love you by, by you finding out who he really is. You know, Pastor Anthony, the other day the Lord spoke to me and he came to me like in a dream. What I, like a dream, but it was more, I was waking up and I could hear him. And he said to me, he said to me, when you, when you search for me, to him, it's, it's an act of love. To him, when I was looking through the, when I do my study, I now understand, oh, glory. I understand that it's not only an act of love, it's romance, it's romantic. Yeah. You're actually spending time and taking time aside. You've cut time out to actually look for him and seek. He can talk to you at any given time, but he holds back and he wants you to come towards him. He's wooing you in those times. And that made a difference in my life of study. Now I know when I get up and study, it's not laborious and you know, oh, I've got to know this, and get on the computer and I've got to oh, No, no. It's romantic. There's an atmosphere that the Lord enjoys that you're searching after him. But as long as you know you're searching for him. Uh-huh. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you search for me in the scriptures to find life. But you never came to me. Mm -hmm. We're not looking for doctrine. We're looking for him. We're looking for him. And all this study is giving us clarity on just what he did. And it causes a love deep within us. Oh, hallelujah. You know, song, the song says that his wine is better than life. And then he goes on to talk about a little bit stronger than but give me the great cakes. Because the, the great cakes, when I eat it, it's the wine, but now I'm having cake because it sustains me in my relationship. That's all he wants with us. He loves you. Incredibly. He loves you incredibly. Amen. If you haven't got that, you might get this. He likes you. He does. Oh, he likes you. Well, Pastor Brian, how, how important is that to him? Me. I mean, I'm just me. I'm just me. How important is that? Well, how much price and value would you put on the blood of Jesus? I've said this many times. If you can put a price on how valuable the blood of Jesus is, now it must be equal to the price that is paid for you. That's how valuable you are because that's the price he paid to get you back. And if you can put a price on the blood, that's the price that's on you. Who are we? Walking around kicking tins and thinking we're nobody and rolling around. Listen, you are a child of the living God. You have his image in you. And he wants to bring us through. He's got us this far. And then he's moved us on to Pentecost. Well, now he wants to move us on into this tremendous feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And God has given us understanding on what this Feast of Trumpets is about. And it says in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, blow the trumpet over the sacrifice. So in other words, speak the prophetic word and then the sacrifice will it will yield up its benefits. It will yield up its truth. When you speak the word over this ear, speak it over it. When you walk as a trumpet over this word, then the principles and laws of the day of atonement will give itself up. Mm. Just got to keep at it. and Keep with it. And God will bring you through. So, just looking at these three major feasts, Leviticus 23 will give you all seven feasts. Now that's just the feast that Jesus fulfilled, but it's the roadmap that we have. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. 
There's a pattern of threes, and we know this. I am the way, the truth, I'm the life. We are justified, sanctified, we're going to be glorified. Uh -huh. Thirtyfold, sixtyfold, he wants to come on us into the hundredfold. In fact, when you read the word in Matthew 30, when Jesus talks about the condition of the heart, he said, but those who bring, and he says this way, a hundredfold and some 60 and some 30. Bible interpretation is interesting because order of reference says, if he said a hundred first, that's where his heart is. His emphasis is getting the first fruits up into the hundredfold. He wants this seed to come fully grown as the man child, who is the character of the father that his voice might flow through. All right. So we understand something here? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll do this little bit of teaching I've got here now. Is that all right? Yeah. Now, trumpets are speaking about unveiling the day of atonement. In the Jewish mind, and among them, the Day of Atonement was the most sacred of all the feasts, was the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is also known in Scripture as the Day of the Lord, the Day of Christ. It says, unto a perfect day. He's speaking still about this day of atonement. He's not talking about Passover, Pentecost. Not talking about it. He's talking about this specific day. Because it's the most sacred of feasts is this day of atonement. It only happened once a year when the priests came in. They get to this point and they take off all their robes and they put on what they call the whites. The white bonnet and everything else was white. And then they were able to pick up the censer, the incense and the blood and they went in and the incense filled the most holy place and he sprinkled the blood seven times oh we might get down to that teaching another time but this is important to know that the day of atonement in scripture is known as what the day of the lord all right turn with me to zechariah chapter three to nine i'm just going to talk a little bit about the day of the lord how it sits here and some of the truths that are spoken prophetically. All right. Now here's, I might use a different pen. Here's something that we should be mindful of. Natural descriptions. All right. Parables are natural descriptions in the word but they are describing spiritual spiritual laws. You got that? All right, let's let me nail it hard. In the Word of God, when it talks about parables, dark sayings, mysteries, and a lot of things that are recorded are written in a natural in a natural format in a natural picture in a natural description as I've written there but we need the spirit of interpretation and prophecy to interpret that and can I say this the word must interpret the word right? that's all throughout scripture the Word of God must interpret itself. So if it's talking about wars and rumors of wars, it is not speaking something that's external. You must keep the context of the Word. Because if you put this outside in the external, then what you're doing is you're taking a natural description and you're trying to interpret something else that's natural. A nat another natural event. So now all of a sudden, it's not opening up the spirit world. Because it's in the spirit world is where the change is. It's in the spirit world that has the impact when you understand it and how to operate in it, that's gonna change the natural. So he's given us natural descriptions 
that are describing specifically laws in the spirit. Amen? Amen. And can I say this as a, I'll give this one to you free, that when you got born again, this Passover happened inside you. Amen? So the laws of Passover, be it Passover, unleavened bread, or first fruits, it happened as a law inside of you. Right? When you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, it happened in you. Amen? It's been said again and again here. Right? Now, three things I make, I make a point of. It happens personally. What do I mean by personally? It means that you're going to know you're the only one here tonight. <clears throat> but, but pastor, I come with cousin here, I come with my brother. No. When it comes to the things of the Spirit, when it comes to how God has set this meeting up, you're the only one here. Because it's personal. When you get that, you, can, you become more attentive and you can appreciate what he's about to say to you. It's you. It's, it's all about you tonight. So it has to be personal. Secondly, it's internal. Right? So we're not going to interpret anything outside of who you are. All right? And I've put this in so many times. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. So he's talking, he's talking and speaking about laws that are already operating either in your spirit man, in your celestial man, or in your physical body. But he is speaking his word into this area. So when he talks about natural descriptions, he is describing spiritual laws that are inside you and that will affect you, either good or bad. It depends on what you know is happening inside. The laws of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Christ is in your spirit. So the laws of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is in you, has set me free from the law of sin and death, which is in your soul. So he's still talking personally and internally. Right? And if he's talking internally, he's also speaking intimately. Why intimately? Because he wants, to knew, he wants you to know his voice. And he has some things that are personal to you that you need to know about what's happening in here. What happens in my wife is different to what happens in me. Right? Even though we're married and all the rest of it and we talk and we fellowship, but there is a world of difference when it comes to understanding my growth, she's got to get a hold of that. It's personal, it's internal, and it's intimate with her. That's how it is. Amen? So the truth here is that I just wanted to put that here before we go into looking at the day of the Lord, that when we come to reading some of the things that the Lord talks about, he uses natural descriptions, but he's actually describing spiritual laws. You know, even numbers, number one, number two, number three, number four, they all have spiritual laws. Number one is oneness. Pretty obvious. Two is that agreement or unity. Three is God, four is the earth, five is grace, six is man or sin, seven is perfection or completeness, right? Eight is resurrection and new life and the beginning of the reign of the spirit man. Nine is finality. Ten is what? Law and order and governance. Eleven is what? Confusion. Right? Twelve is government. It goes on. There's other numbers. But all I'm saying is that's a, that's a, a, a natural, a physical number, but it speaks loud in the spirit world when God puts his breath and life to it. Mm-hmm. You can't keep it external. Like, for example, look, I, I had to say to some of our people up there, we we'll get to a, a table at coffee club. Oh, I'm tired of coffee club now. But we go there, because my wife loves coffee cup. You know, I don't mind the eggs, pasta. Yeah. Benedict eggs. <laughs> but we go there and they give you a number. And what some Christians do is they look at that number and they think, oh, it's number seven. Oh, it's, it's, it's going to be a complete restful day today because I've got the number seven. And I saw one lady, she, one Christian there, that lady pulled out and gave her number 13. Oh, I don't want that number. And she was going through the numbers. Listen to me. 
When you start to interpret God's word in a natural way, you're getting into, you're getting into superstition. That's not God. You've got to keep it where it, where it was meant to be. He spoke in the natural, but he was re always referring to laws in the spirit, and he'll always refer to you in the spirit and what he sees in you. Personal, internal, intimate. It's inside you. So you can't play around with natural things, things that are external. You can't use the word to interpret external things. Right? Unless something happens and the Spirit of God talks to you that there's a set of circumstances that have taken place and then he refers something to you, that's different. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about the source of it, where it's coming from. It's got to come out of your spirit to interpret natural descriptions that, that's describing spiritual laws. Otherwise, when you get heavy into the book of Revelation, you're going to end up with all sorts of natural phenomena phenomena that's going to happen in the you know, the Middle East and, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And we talk an external, when it was always talking about laws on the inside, internal. Amen? Yeah. So that tells me a lot. When we get to discuss the man of sin. The man of sin is not external. If everything we've said so far about being internal, personal, and intimate then the man of sin, who is the nature of the Adamic race, when Adam sinned, he fell. And that nature of sin that he fell with is inside us. Because that's what Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5 speak about, that the federal head, when he sinned, he passed sin on to all the world, to all of us. Because inside of us is a nature and character of sin that sits in there, and the Bible just refers to that at times as the beast, but also as the man of sin. But it's internal, it's not external. So you get a lot of ministries that have yet to come into this area, are still sitting here saying external things that the man of sin is someone over there in the Middle East, he's probably half Jew, half Palestinian, with a Taliban twist, and, and he's doing something he shouldn't do. He's got a lot of money, and he's going to influence the world. He's going to make this covenant. Plus, that I'll have to talk on the book of Daniel soon. Because I want to nail this, this area here that's gone right away from the word of God. This seven-year covenant, I'll talk about that. It's not what we heard. It's not what we heard here. You know, back in the 70s, there was a big move of this, uh, of, the, of the end times in the 70s. I'm old enough to be around and hearing all that being here for the charismatic move and all of this. But back in those days, we used to get a lot of this end time teaching, right? And it was all coming out of Pentecost. And I've read the books and it never excited me. It was too hard. You know, the economy's gonna crash, you know, there's no money. And if I could write a check to myself of how much they say that the money is not going to, is gonna be a financial disaster, you know, you know what I said to the Lord? I said, Lord, they said there's going to be no more money. You know what he said to me? Nothing has left the earth. <laughs> it's all here. Nothing's left the earth. And even, uh, look, I don't know where you sit on this climate change, but according to the word, he said, as long as the earth is, as long as you can feel the earth under your feet, Summer and autumn, winter and harvest time and sea time will always be. So I go like this and I say, no, we're still here and God is still in charge. Amen. He's still the boss of the planet. Amen. 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 Jesus is the CEO. Yeah. Oh, and the Holy Spirit is whoever he wants to be to make it all happen. All right. So I just thought I'd mention a little bit about that because when we come into this word, at least you know my heart, I'm trying to, given understanding in the spirit that affects us when we understand it when we declare it it works for us and guess what it's a law you can't change laws if, if it's a law in the spirit it'll always work for you it'll always work because you found a law you speak it you live by it it'll work for you all right Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9 What are we talking about? The day of the Lord. Right? 
the day of the Lord, it's talking, the word day is really speaking about revelation because remember back in Genesis, he called the light day. So light also means revelation. So it's the revelation of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the revelation of the Lord. All right? And when you look, when you look through scripture on the word day, it is everywhere through the word. Why? Why would that be so important? Because this day of atonement is where we are changed, is when Jesus is going to manifest in and through us on this time, on this time frame here. All right, so the day of the Lord. He says this, For behold, the stone that I have laid. Upon the stone are seven eyes, and behold, I will engrave its inscription, right? Says the Lord. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in how many days? One day. One day. day of atonement was only one day. Hmm? When you look at eternity, I would think it's true. If his word says we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and God does a lot of things in moments. <laughs> in moments. In mo you know, a moment is you can't, you can't, you can't divide a moment. You, you, you can get, you know, one hour, half an hour, one minute, 60 seconds, you can divide to 60 seconds, but you can't divide a moment. In other words, we're going to be here, and then it's going to, the next thing is we're here. Changed. In a moment. In a twinkling of an eye. Right? This is what the scriptures are speaking. But looking at this here, he says, the iniquity of the land, he will remove it in one day. Hmm. How long did Jesus live for? 33 and a half years, right? And his ministry was for three and a half years, is that right? And he made such an influence across the country and across, around the world. Just his three and a half years of ministry. But he died in one day. From the morning, they took him to judgment at nine. They crucified him. And he was on the cross for however long. And then they took him down in the afternoon. But Jesus awoke out of that prayer and he died that same day. One day. One day he fulfilled it all. Oh, I've got some stuff here I want to talk to you about sometime. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you about the blood. Mm. All right. So he says, for behold, the stone... Matthew 16, 16 says it's the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the rock, the stone. Who's the rock? The revelation, this is the rock, the revelation that you get that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's when life comes into you. Out of that revelation, you will repent. Out of that revelation, you turn towards him. It has to be infused in you. There has to be a quickening by the Spirit of God. And it comes down to this revelation. You know Jesus is the Son of God. And upon that rock, he builds the rest of his revelation. Builds the rest of his church. The foundation. And if you don't have that revelation, then there's nothing else that will stick to you that you would believe. So it's important that we understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So when I have people to come out and they want to give their hearts to the Lord, I at least put that in front of them. Say these words. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for me and God the Father raised him from the dead. Just that, the Bible says they're saved. Well, push it on then by saying, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your precious blood. I now receive you as Lord and Savior. But the act of the Spirit had already taken place once you believed Jesus was the Son of the living God. That's the foundation. Amen? That's the revelation. So, behold the stone, he said, that I have laid. The Lord has laid. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 28 says, by the way, I said I'm going to give you all my notes. But you still take notes what you've got. Isaiah 28, 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, 
a tried stone. Hallelujah. A tried stone. Amen. So the revelation of who Jesus was when he walked out on the earth, he was faced with everything of sin and death and humiliation and mocking. Everything came at him, but he stood strong because it couldn't move this foundation that was wrapped up in him. You see, when the father spoke in Genesis chapter 2, when the father spoke, right, in chapter 2 verses 1 and 3, it says that he finished everything that he wanted to say, well, it had to go somewhere. What he said had to go somewhere. Well, it went into the fabric of the character of the Christ. He spoke it into the character. So the Christ, the character, was in the spirit world waiting for Jesus to come. And when Jesus came, this character was in him. But he had to walk it out. But when he walked it out, nothing could stop him from fulfilling the character that was speaking to him on the inside to do what his father had said and put in the character. Amen. Amen. In other words, the character was like the tape recorder, the CD. Everything that the eternal father said that was to happen was put in him. And so all the shadows came, you know, all the shadows, the tabernacles, the covenants, the priesthood, the law and the prophets, all these things had come, but Jesus fulfilled all of them in one man. This was a shadow. He became the substance of that shadow. And now he's released into the earth and now those who are born again get this substance those who are speaking tongues and baptized in the spirit they get this particular one in the substance it's not a shadow anymore but now we're coming to this substance which is the fullness of who Christ is then we become a son it's not a shadow anymore amen, amen. see the church the woman this is the woman she'll become the bride and it says in Revelation chapter 12 he said he saw the woman with the moon under her feet. The moon is a type of reflection. Well, it's a reflection. It's the shadows. We have been living by shadows and then they get fulfilled. But there's coming a day when the church shall have all the shadows under her feet. And she will stand on the shadows in victory as the true substance of the church of the living God. Amen. Because the word would be made real in her. So these shadows are not, you know, Song of Songs says that there's coming a day when the shadows will flee away. Why will they flee away? Because the substance has come. And when is it going to come? On the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. All right, so it says here that I have laid before Joshua. What's another name for Joshua? Jesus. Yeshua, mm, the tabernacle of Yeshua. I have laid before Joshua upon the stone, upon the stone, upon the immovable, invincible character, the stone, a seven eyes. Seven speak of perfection but completeness, and the eyes speak of vision. This is speaking about the whole counsel of God. All the feasts, everything of who Christ is, the seven eyes is the complete vision that was in the heart of the Father for you. Amen? It's a character, people. It's a character. You see, you say, Pastor Brian, characters, how can characters talk? Well, let me just go to this one here we're familiar with, this man of sin character. He never shuts up. He's always talking to you. This goes on all the time. You can't even sleep with this thing talking. Is that right? This thing does not like God. It's hostile, the Bible says, to the things of God. But it's the character that speaks. Your body speaks. No, not. How can, I can't hear my body talking. All right. Don't eat for five days. Your body will talk. I want Hungry Jacks. I want McDonald's. It'll carry on at night and noon and morning. It'll continue talking. Well, inside of us there is a character called the man of sin. And he speaks, but he puts out words that are poisonous, that are deadly against the things of God. And he'll keep you in bondage. That's why we've got to learn to talk out of the spirit man. 
Because the spirit man has already crossed over. We need to be speaking back to the, the soul man. We need to be speaking into this area and deal with his lies. Deal with his own manipulation. His own domination. Huh? And his own intimidation. And those three words are happening in us for this reason. To control you. Intimidation manipulation domination for the purpose of control here it is that's witchcraft right there you don't need to go to deep africa you don't need to go up the fly river to find witchcraft it's inside of us here he is right inside here voices to manipulate voices to dominate voices to intimidate it's coming up to control to control who you Sometimes we just get used to what we think is, well, is this my personality? No, it's this character in there. Leave him alone. Just walk around him like eggshell. You know, this is how he is. Yeah, he's bound. Shut up with this character. Mm hmm. But see, there's coming a day, 2 Thessalonians, which is my teaching, it's supposed to be tonight, that the man of sin was going to be revealed. As I said, it doesn't say that the man of sin is going to what? Manifest. As it says, he'll be revealed. When that happens, you can see by revelation that you and I have an issue with a character in us. But the Lord, when he shows it to you, he also has trained you to speak to it. Amen. Because the Bible says that when the man of sin is revealed, he will be consumed. Oh, consumed is a fire term. He will be consumed with the... At the breath of his mouth. Breath is spirit, mouth is words. He will be consumed with the spirit of his word. That's why God's training us. Yes. Teaching us this language, how to deal with this area. God knows how to do it. He's not going to get you standing up there and say, you know, Lord, just deliver me, Lord. No, he's going to train you. He's going to equip you. He's going to tell you how to talk and talk out of your spirit. Mm, Christians are lazy. They don't bother studying. Too busy and distracted with everything else in life, and yet their inheritance is going down the tube. And we've got to say, Father, I need to understand. I need to understand that what this feast is about, this is coming into my inheritance. Oh, one day I'll talk on the inheritance, but I want to tell you, God gifted you with this understanding. This is your inheritance. God wants you to become a son of the living God. Not servants, but son. Hurios. Not technon, technion, but hurios in the Greek. A mature son, a mature character that understands all that God has done for him and he will be perfected. Amen. That's it. That's where he wants us to go. So he's giving us inside of us, we have the seven eyes. We have the complete vision. The whole counsel of God. Everything that's in there, we have the mind of God. Christ is in us. Mm. Now he says this. He talks about that. Behold, I will engrave its inscription. Oh, hallelujah. I will carve this into your character. In other words, they say, I will, the Lord said, I'll write it into the fleshy tables of your heart. That's all he's saying here. I will inscribe it into you, the character. Amen? Amen. That could be a wonderful day. Eh? When this man of sin is completely removed and the mind of Christ, the character of Christ is replaced, you can't think anything else but what the mind of Christ is thinking. You talk, speak, walk like the character that's inside of you. God's going to change that character inside. He didn't do it here in Passover. He just touched our spirit man. He didn't do it in Pentecost. No, that, that's in our spirit man. We speak in tongues and we are alive in God and we can do all of those things and God blesses our mind and our body. It's like we're drip, he's drip feeding us for, for, for that time. But now tabernacles, it's different. These two feasts sit locked up in their parameters back up in this area of the spirit man. Never to come down in its fullness because that's not its purpose. 
but the Feast of Tabernacles sits in my spirit, but now through trumpets, it's beginning to sound an alarm to wake up my holy church in Zion, and it's about to come down. That's its purpose, is to come down and remove the man of sin, wash the woman, and change the body. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hitting everything up here, sorry. Oh, hallelujah. I t I t I'm that excited. I'm that excited. You know what I'm going to do? Throw chairs around. <laughs> I think it all started in Cardwell. But I just got something in my heart about this. Every one of us is born in this generation to hear this. This is not a casual walk through the park. In this file, it's not some sort of, you know, place of games and holidays. It's a warfare going on here. Going on inside you. God's going to deal with it. Hey, I've never said anything about the demon, about the dragon, about the devil. No, we're talking about a character. That it has his character in there. Way back in the garden, he put his character in there. His C word went into Adam and Eve. And that's what we're struggling with now. Yes, we're going to deal and see the demonic dealt with. But God's priority in this feast is to deal with this man of sin that's in here. Once you've dealt with the fear inside, any fear on the outside means nothing to you. God's got to deal with this area. Amen. What would you look like if the law of sin and death was totally removed out of you? And what would you look like when Christ put his character inside your soul? You'd look a little bit different. You know what happened? Your body will have to change to the change of the character that's going on here. When you get this brand new generator, then this body has to change. Oh, hey! Because it's a change of a character. That's what Paul was saying. Mm -hmm. Some people will see death and they'll get into this feast. But some people that are here tonight won't taste death at all. Can you say amen? amen. So he says, <clears throat> he says, I will engrave its inscription. Second Corinthians chapter 3, it says, You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not in tablets of stone, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. There's an inscription. Amen. Amen. And then he says, Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So this is where the iniquity is. And he says in one day, what day? The day of the Lord, the day of atonement. This is the day here that God's going to move and remove that and the Christ will come. And that change will take place. Amen. People of God, there's so much of his word that I'm starting to see and how it just, nothing's moved out of order. It still sits in its place. And I can go through the book of Revelation and tell you what's uh, the Feast of the Trumpets and what is the position of the Day of Atonement. And also the last one down here, which I haven't written up, <clears throat> is the Tabernacles, Tabernacles proper, they call it. They say, they say proper as a word but it means it's the, it's the reality of the tabernacle. What tabernacle? This building here? No, this tabernacle, right? Our body is going to be transformed. The way Jesus came out of the tomb, that's the sort of body you will have. Isn't that amazing? That's the sort of body that you're going to have. It's the same body. So when you see him, we shall be like him. But the real ministry and, and the... The arm wrestle is going on on the inside of you is in this area here. But God has given us, he's not left us without instructions. He's given us the feast of trumpets, which is the prophetic eyes to see, prophetic ears to hear, to understand the laws of the day of atonement, the day that brings change, the day that brings transformation, the day that will eradicate the law of sin and death out of me and replace it with Christ, who will be the mind of Christ inside. All of that truth is still sitting up in your spirit, waiting for this season, this season, to open up where God will start to move. But before he does that, he has to instruct 
each and every one of us of the season in which we're living. Amen? So, I'll give a couple more scriptures and we'll sort of tie it up here. Proverbs 4 verse 18. 4 verse 18. Oh, I'm sure you know this scripture. It says, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. What's the perfect day? The day of atonement. That's where we're coming into perfection. Mm -hmm. We're coming into perfection. <clears throat> so the path of the just, right? The path is speaking about the character. Once again, it's not talking about a physical path. It's talking in the spirit. And when it talks about the path, it's talking about the character. Jesus said, I am the way. That's the path. I am the way, the path. I am the way is a character. Okay? So the path of the just. Uh, Isaiah 35 talks about the highway of holiness. It's a character. It's a character that leads you and guides you on the inside. It's not a physical highway in heaven. It's a character. There's no physical gold in heaven. It's a divine character. And the character is what leads you. We don't have rosters in heaven. You will sing in the choir tonight. That doesn't happen. You need to be over here. No, the character, it's already been inscribed and it's already written inside of you. What you're going to do in a billion years from now is already written in you. Let me put it in this phrase. Eternity is finalized in you. Your eternity, what you're going to do throughout eternity is already finalized. <laughs> you don't get up to heaven and say, hmm, what am I doing now? Oh Lord, you got anything for me today? No, you're pumped. You're alive. You're ready. To... Can I go? Can I go? Mm. Oh, I'm going to talk about the crown that's on his head. Oh, glory. Dominion. In all three dimensions, in the spirit world, in the celestial world, and in the physical, we will rule and reign. And God, see, he said he's king of what? Kings. You're a king. So he's going to give you a domain to rule over forever. And that will expand. But your pace and what God's got in you already will keep pace with that dominion. All right. So, it says here, but the path of the just is what? Like shining sun. The character <clears throat> of the just, sorry, the path of the just, I wanted to say this, is also written in Revelations 22, verse 2. Hey, just quickly, just have a look at that. Pastor, I'll, I'll, almost, I'll try and finish here somewhere. Is that all right? Revelations 22. Look at the wording and the understanding of this. He says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Right? It says, In the midst of the street of it. This is the river that's coming out. Then he says, uses another term. Right? When it says river, he's not talking about a physical river up in heaven. It's spiritual laws of life that's flowing. I could teach more on that, but verse 2 says, in the midst, in the middle, in the midst, which is the place of governance. It's not a geographical place. It's talking about governance. So when it says that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the midst, it wasn't speaking about a geographical position in the garden. It was saying that there was an entity that had governance within him that would speak out of himself into something. He could transfer his character by words into something. So the Lord said, don't go near that tree that's in the midst because he has the ability to father something in you. But what do they do? Go over there and talk with him. Or well, she did. I shouldn't say she did. I'm just saying Eve went over, right? And then the conversation happened. Oh, I could, wish I could talk on that a little bit. But you see, she was deceived from the very beginning. The Bible says that he was subtle than any beast of the field. Subtle. So he was already in his, uh, 
He was already in his, his uh, you know, might say his garment of deception, but he fooled her. She didn't know that she, he was the one that God had talked about, right? And the conversation went, I don't want to get caught into this now, but the conversation went, but he put his word in her. And when she believed and received, that's the physical word for eat, ate. She ate of the fruit. The fruit was his character. It was words that she spoke. And when she believed and she believed and received, she submitted, see? And then she believed and received. And the moment she received it, she partook of that tree. She received the character. Gave some of that words to her husband. He also partook. He ate or he believed and received it. And it went into the character. And the Bible says, then their eyes, their carnal eyes were open. Now all they could see what was in the natural, in the soulish dimension. They lost prophetic vision. They lost it. And God is going to give us back that vision through this feast here. Yeah. Eyes to see, ears to hear. Get up in the spirit again and look to see out of your spirit man exactly your deliverance is on its way. Amen. What we lost in the garden, Jesus gave it back to us. But there has to be a process for us to come through. Amen? It's important that we understand it. So, he says, in the midst of the street, this street is the way, it's the character, but in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. So it says, on either side of the river, there is a tree of life. How can you have the tree of life on either side of this river? Unless it was a picture instructing us, go to somewhere else, which is the tabernacle of Moses. We see the Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark had an angel here, and it had another angel there, all right? Trying to draw this angel. This was one piece of gold. The lid, the mercy seat, and these two cherubs. But it was one piece. So he's saying, on either side of this river was the tree of life. He's saying it's one piece. He's talking about the mercy seat. He's talking about the tabernacle. He's talking about this covenant that he's cut with us. This is the mind of Christ. It is the tree of life. But he says in the midst, in the midst of it, there's a river that's flowing of life. And when you read Revelation chapter 11, it says the two witnesses, they, their dead bodies, and it's the word carcass, which means the living sacrifice, was in the midst of the street. It's saying that the living sacrifice was put on the altar in the mercy seat to get the mind of Christ. Yeah. Amen. It's all there, people. It's a picture. It's a natural description describing spiritual laws. Spiritual laws where? Inside us. Never external. We're going to understand what he's saying here. Because the word carcass in the book of Matthew, it says that the carcass is where the eagles gather. Does that remember that? The carcass is the same word for the dead bodies. Is the same position of the street that the street is talking about here. You got that? So the carcass is where all the eagles gather. What does it mean by that? They gather to the living sacrifice. What are the eagles? The prophetic word. So all the prophetic words that have been spoken are going to find their rest on the living sacrifice in the day of atonement. Amen. The day of atonement fulfills every prophetic word. That's why Jesus said, I haven't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill it. Every prophetic word will be fulfilled in me. And on that day of atonement, it happened. Whoa. There's something alive in you. But why? What's all that about? All this sacrifice. Oh, glory. What's the living sacrifice doing in there? Sprinkle the blood seven times. 
It was this complete sacrifice. Oh, Jesus bled seven times. That's another Tuesday. What for, Pastor? Why was a sacrifice? Why do all of that? For one reason. There's a God in heaven that wants the fragrance of worship. That's what he's after. And when you become the living sacrifice, his fragrance is coming off you forever. Every time you move to do his will, it gives off his fragrance. Tells you to do this, off comes the fragrance. And the father, this is why my sons are who they are. And they stand in my presence. This truly is the fulfillment of worship in spirit and truth. It will come through the character of a living sacrifice through his sons. Amen. Amen. Yo. So then it says, I'll finish here, I think. It's like the shining sun. What does the sun mean? We don't go outside and look at the sun up there and say, oh, he's talking about the physical sun. No. He's using the natural description of the sun as a spiritual truth that it's representing the Father. The moon is Jesus. The stars are the Holy Spirit right through the word. In this context, it's speaking about the Son, meaning the Father. He says, but the path of the just is like the shining sun. It's the Father's DNA that shines ever brighter. So the Son or the Father that's in you, how, what does it mean by shining brighter? It means that we are getting greater understanding. And it's the dawning of a new day. It's the understanding that's coming up. And when it fully comes up, we fully understand. And the son or the father's face comes through. It's a face-to-face -face experience. It's not dreams and visions. It's not parables and mysteries. It's face-to-face. -face. In fact, it's interface. His face coming through my face. Mm -hmm. Oh, hallelujah. Whoever sees you when this change comes, they'll know you are a son of the Father because you'll look like him. Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll look like him. Can I say this? It's in the word. I'll say this. Okay. Okay. No, I'll leave that. I, I, I've got to go back, you know, and walk up. I like, I can't, I can't do it any other way. If I tell you, you go, oh, yeah. Hmm. But if I lead you there, uh, you pick up a few little things on the way. And by the time you see it, <laughs> it's only the start of another one. Amen. Amen. That's who he is. So he says here, but the path of the just is the is like is like there's a key like is like the shining sun it's the dna of the father that shines ever brighter unto what unto the perfect day until the perfect day he'll keep shining and giving you understanding and giving you an understanding until the sun rises in you until that is completed inside of you he's faithful to you amen In this world, we've got to be careful that we don't sleep on it. That we don't go to sleep. That we've got to say, Father, we've got to keep up with where the word is. Keep up with what God is doing. Amen. He's gracious, he's faithful, but we've got to be there sometimes. Amen. All right, just a couple more scriptures and then I'll close it off. We didn't even get anywhere near the man of sin tonight. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Because the scripture says... In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, it says, don't be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, right, has come or is at hand. 
Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. This day will not come until there is a falling away. And we talked about falling away. We talked about the, the high mind of the, uh, the, the high places of the carnal mind must fall away when we come into the scripture or when we come into the Feast of Tabernacles. All that way we see things with our own mind has got to fall away and then the man of sin is revealed. You, 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 <laughs> Pastor Anthony, you can never see this, you can't see the man of sin if the man of sin is still, is still looking at himself. <laughs> he can't identify himself. That understanding has got to be removed. So the spirit of God is looking through you. Hey, there he is. But that set of principles of looking and the way we look. See, most times we're looking through our beastly nature. We're still looking through our soul. We're still looking through the character that Adam put in, put in us through this character. We're still looking through that. Still looking through the beastly eyes. Occasionally we get a revelation. Occasionally we see something of God. But for the most of it, we're reading and looking through this character. So he's saying, how can you know this unless this prophetic word removes that way of seeing and removes the way of hearing, then he's revealed by the Spirit. So, hmm. Hebrews chapter 10, 25. I'm, I keep saying I'm finished. And I'll stop when you all go home. That was a joke. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Almost done. Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together. Now when I was back in the day, when I read that scripture, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Right? And I used to think that the assembling of ourselves together meant we've got to get together. We've got to come to church. We've got to assemble ourselves together. True. In Passover. True Pentecostal understanding. True that is. But when you measure it against when he's talking about the day, you've got to move that whole scripture across to the day. Now it changes its context. It changes its meaning. And so when I look at this, it says, not forsaking the assembly. That Greek word is episynagogue. Epi means above. Synagogue means a place of gathering. So he's saying that don't forsake getting up in the spirit and knowing we can see one another in fellowship in the spirit. That's what he's saying. He said, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together in the spirit. He says, as is the manner or the custom of some are, but exhorting one another, right? Exhorting one another with the apostolic and prophetic word. That's what I'm doing tonight. I'm trying to exhort you. That's all I've come down here for. Is to exhort you with this word. And he says here. To exhort one another. As so much the more. As you see the day. This day is approaching. And I want to say that this day is approaching. As the Lord is my witness, I've spent most of my life here, but it comes down to understanding this last move of God, this last river that's come. It was all for this. Amen. I understand that because I thought the end of the road was here. Who did that? Somebody over here has got this. Somebody's got that. Just to do all that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it was only scaffolding. It was only put together to move me to the main game. And Jesus paid the entire price. I am to be changed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 says that when he returns, when he returns, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will they be sanctified? Spirit, soul, body. That's what he says. The only time in the word of God he puts those three words together. Spirit, Soul and body, 2 Thessalonians 5.23. Why? Because he was talking about the return of Christ. Why? Because the purpose of the day of atonement is to remove the law of sin and death out of us and to wash our soul in order that our body transforms so that we are sanctified when he comes, spirit, soul, and body. We are complete just like him. That when we see him coming, we will be like him. 
Amen? Oh, people of God. We've got to keep going towards this light. No time for laying down. You know, oh, let's go over here for a little while. Yeah, this we've got church on. I'll go over and do a couple more things. Mm, yeah. No. Don't get lost over there. Your inheritance is inside of you. But Pastor Brian, I can't remember everything you said tonight. Hey, do not, do not think that your spirit man does not receive understanding the way God is going to bring you through. You know what? It's the condition of your heart that will give you the greatest understanding to position you for the change. Humility of heart. Nothing to do with the education. I've gone up there to, up to uh, Tobaville, up to New Guinea, in Kianga, and I've spoken even to the young people, and first time, first time hearing it, I thought after 15 minutes, I thought, I was thinking to myself, I was teaching, teaching, and I'm thinking, they're not understanding, I can see it. M maybe I should learn pigeon. No, 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 I don't know. I'll just, I, I'm, I'm me, I'll just have to, after 15 minutes, Whoa ho, a oh, whoa ho. I saw a blanket go off the whole meeting. A blanket of unbelief. I saw it, oh, it just went off like that. And they all sat up and they understood clearly the word of the living God. When you hear with your heart, because you have an intention to hear, your intent is, I want to know. And I'm coming to God. Guess what? He'll lead you all the way. Because you already have the first fruits in you. You already have Christ in you. Have a heart to understand. And guess what? Those things will come to you every day. God will show you. Amen? Amen. Welcome to the new day, people. Yes. It's a brand new day. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I've only got four other scriptures left. I'll just give them to you. You can write them down. 2 Peter 1 verse 19, right? 2 Peter 1 verse 19, and Ephesians 4 30. I'll just leave it like that. If you want any more, go and search the word. Have you got that down? Malachi 4 1 to 6, Zephaniah 1 to 14, Joel 2 1 to 11. All right, if you didn't get that, you can listen online, possibly. 2 Peter 1 19, and so we have the prophetic word. Ooh, glory. What prophetic word? So we have the prophetic word. What prophetic word? This prophetic word. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do, do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. What's the dark place? This head. That's the darkest thing that's in me, is this head. This here, the mind, my mind, it's dark. But this prophetic word is a light that'll shine in there and light it up. Hey, what's in here? Yeah, he's in there. You'll just see these eyes in there. Don't talk about me, please. I'm comfortable here. No, you're coming out. It's a good day, eh? Dark place until the day dawns and the morning star shines in our hearts people of God we're in for a good journey now next Tuesday night we won't be here we'll, we'll be flying back uh, the following Tuesday if it's alright I'll, I'll try and finish off the man of sin uh, because as I said there's steps uh, I say the man of sin but it starts in the garden with Jesus sweating great drops of blood. Ooh, there's something there. I might preach it up there at York. But the point I'm making is that when I come back on that following Tuesday, I'll continue and finish that out. Is that all right? Okay. Everybody all right? Yes. Amen, amen. Father, we thank you for tonight. We ask an ongoing blessing and, and revelation. And Lord, take away all this, uh, this, uh, this thing that puts a blindness that comes over our minds at times. Lord, we speak against it. We command it to be removed in order, order for us to see what you're saying in us. We commit ourselves afresh tonight. Thank you for a new day. The day of the Lord is shining in us. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.
and amen.